a very warm welcome to vivek shukla and a very warm good evening to everyone hi vivek hi uh, okay yes so, hi <laughs> it's only our belief whether yes i can or yes i will that makes a huge difference success has no shortcuts we all understand and accept that in challenge we score every day to reach where our ultimate goal is and at that point of time there are some people who set an example for others to derive inspiration and learn from with these words i would like to invite mr vivek shukla on third episode of ignited minds a very warm welcome mr vivek to ignited minds thank you it's a pleasure to be here always i love to interact with uh, with students with youngsters always a pleasure thank you so we have lots and lots of them for you we wake today <laughs> yes it's exciting so, uh, yeah so now i would like to uh, hand over to my uh, co-host sri harsha and ms mudula to proceed the session thank you sir thank you so much sir a very gracious afternoon to you all and i hope you all had your great lunch so it's my pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome to you all your presence makes us really happy welcome to united minds here is your host mridula pandey with my co-host sri harsha i must say harsha today we are going to have some amazing conversations related to healthcare industry yeah you're right mridula someone beautifully said you know if your action inspires others to dream more learn more do more and become more you are a leader exactly resembling with these lines we have joining us today a a visionary leader a man who had made made his mark in the field of healthcare with his brilliance i am really honored to tell you all about him to give you a brief intro of him he has an exceptionally illustrious Uh, career so far with around of 20 years with a valuable experience he has a rich experience in healthcare field in india as well as middle east for various organizations like asdm frost and selenium so without wasting a single minute of of time we would like mr vivek shukla sir to throw some light on his career path and what are the challenges he faced and what has made him today to be mr vivek shukla over to you sir <laughs> all right thank you very much i think this is um, a little exaggeration of what i have done but okay uh, i don't think i've done too much but yes i have about 20 years now 22 years now in healthcare and my life and career in uh, my career has more been more of a uh maverick you know maverick is like a rebel like somebody who does extra things somebody who does opposite than what others do so i have done a lot of uh different unique things which others usually don't so uh for example i have done a normal mba i have not done a healthcare mba uh after my normal mba i had a job with a fortune 500 company and i did not take the campus placement and i instead went and did something uh, unusual which is i went back to my small hometown to run my own hospital then uh, after running my own hospital for a few years i did something unusual again i started a consulting company of my own and i started consulting alone from a very small town in himachal pradesh i used to travel 15 20 days a month to all over india and abroad uh to consult with various groups various hospitals um i did that for a number of years uh, and then uh at an age where people are thinking of an alternate career at that age when people are thinking of what they will do in retirement i took up a job that was my first job i was in mid 30s uh and i took up my first job so people usually don't take up a job in mid mid 30 so i did a job for 5 years uh and then i i uh, was working with uh, in dubai with aster ne and healthcare for 5 years then i went uh, to frost and sullivan for two more years and then I, i again i made a switch to doing my own consulting work so yes i've done a lot of unusual things uh, which has been i think the hallmark of uh, whatever i have done so far when i started uh, way back um, 
20 years ago, I, 22 years ago. Uh, early 2000s, I started talking about marketing of hospitals and marketing and healthcare. And that was another unusual thing because at that time, healthcare was a very, very um, uh, so-called, uh, you know, doctors and hospitals were not supposed to do marketing. You know, it was a dirty word, right? Uh, I used to go to conferences and senior professors and senior doctors and surgeons, you know, they will start, uh, they will get up from the audience and start uh, asking me tough questions, you know, what are you doing to healthcare? Because they think marketing is like, you know, making uh, making a fool of somebody or conning somebody or something. So that was another unusual thing I did. I started writing articles on healthcare branding, healthcare marketing. Um, now it's not as bad. Now people accept marketing in healthcare. Uh, but in those old days, you know, it was slightly challenging. So, yes, so I think it's been a mix of a lot of uh, different, unique, unusual, rebellious things that I have done all across, and I continue to do that. Uh, so I, that's, I think, that summarizes. <laughs> Sorry for this interruption. No problem. I was just asking that uh, as you worked in India and Middle East, what are the challenges and what are the differences you feel? And what are the new trends is going on right now there? And what is lacking here? What do you feel? Just there are uh, many differences. There are many differences. So India is more of a, I would say India, see, uh, in Middle East, there are a few things you have to take care of. One is that this is you have to uh, be aware of that in Middle East, 90% population or 80% in some countries, uh, a large amount of people who live in these countries are expats. They have come from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Philippines, uh, various, various countries, right? So uh, in most countries here, till a long time, the healthcare was only for primary and secondary level because somebody needs a heart surgery or brain surgery, they will go back to their home country. So uh, for a very long time, and now things are changing. So uh, there is a tertiary level care getting available here, but for a very long time, it was mostly primary, secondary, mid tertiary level. Any emergency like a um, like a cardiac procedure or something can be done here. But once it becomes something which is, uh, which is high end and which requires uh, intervention, the people prefer home countries. That's how it was for many years. However, it's changing now. What has changed it is insurance. Because in some countries, insurance is, everyone has insurance like in UAE, Abu Dhabi has almost 100% insurance. Dubai has 100% insurance. Apart from these two states, these two Emirates, others are also moving towards 100% insurance. Other countries like Saudi, Oman, uh, and, and maybe even Qatar, I'm, I'm not sure, but other countries have also announced uh, compulsory or 100% insurance for everyone, whether it is their citizens or whether it's expats. So that's changing things in a big way. Uh, another difference is that in, 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 in Middle East, in GCC, uh, even the OPD is covered under insurance, unlike India, where you only have uh, inpatient covered under insurance. And in India, I think typical uh, 50 to 60 percent load of a hospital is insurance and rest is cash. Um, here it has become almost 99 percent or 90, not, not 99, maybe around 90, 92 percent is insurance and rest is cash. So that's a, that's a difference. Uh, that's one major difference. Uh, uh, you know, the level of care and uh, uh, insurance. Now, in some parts in GCC, in, uh, in Middle East, there is um, the ratio between hospitals to people is really, uh, is really high. Uh, so there are enough hospitals, there are enough doctors. Uh, you know, I could even say in one or two places, there might even be oversupply of hospitals and doctors. So uh, that's not the case in India. India still is, uh, except for the metro cities, most places there's still, uh, uh, there is more demand and less supply. Uh, here, demand supply is almost equal. In some places, uh, supply may be even slightly more than what is demanded. So these are major differences. Thank you, sir. So uh, the other question we just uh, want to ask you, like, uh, uh, this is about the COVID situation, as right now we all are facing, like the whole world. So what, what changes do you think, like, now we are adopting in the new era? of this after COVID, post COVID situation. How are we going to handle those marketing, of, because you already worked in marketing consultancy, like you already worked as a consultant advisor of CHC level also. 
So I think you have a, a much you know what to say about post COVID. What can be the situations or what what can be the changes are going to be ready or already maybe implemented for hospitals. In the marketing, in the marketing, in the marketing of hospitals. Yeah. Okay, the marketing of hospitals. Okay. Marketing of hospitals will change. Uh, has already changed. Changed a lot. Um, there is a lot of uh, focus on digital uh, marketing now. So there is a lot of online digital focus. Uh, also, the marketing has become more of. Uh, you know, it's a balance between COVID and non-COVID. So uh, when the COVID patients are more, you're not doing much of elective surgeries. So then the shift changes to. Uh, to a different uh, different kind of marketing. Once the COVID patients are less and hospitals are COVID free or they have less patients, then you want to start promoting elective surgeries and the backlog of elective surgeries needs to be cleared. In short, I would say um, it's more of digital and online now. Uh, the budgets are uh, are less than what they were before. There's a lot of, um, in a lot of hospitals, they don't have large marketing departments anymore. They want people, you know, uh, because they don't want to have a full-time uh, resources, like, a, you know, eight people, 10 people, 20 people marketing team in a, in a hospital. They want to have a lean uh, marketing system, which works on more or less automated way uh, in a digital online space. And they engage outside experts from time to time, whenever they need extra push. They will get outside people to come, some consultants and some people who are experts in this field to come and support them. And whenever there is, uh, so they, there is much, there's, there's more focus on uh, a lean marketing engine, which is driven by online uh, online uh, activities. Yes, yeah, it's, it's nowadays almost a digital world. I think so. Vivek, uh, you mentioned, I mean, something very interesting when you were telling about yourself that you didn't get placement when you were in college, correct? Yeah, I got a placement. I got a placement, but I didn't go to, I didn't join it. Okay. So, see, I just, because, you know, that is a very, very common question or a very common challenge. I mean, we have in India as well. So, sometimes people get the placement, sometimes they do not get and they don't want to join. So, right. Uh, what was it basically that kept you moving at that point of time? And I mean, what made you so headstrong that this is not what you wanted to join and you wanted to pursue something else? Because when we are in college, we are more worried about getting a job, getting into some job and uh, start earning uh, as soon as possible. So people sometimes picks up what they are not supposed to pick up as well. Yes. So what's your take on that? I mean, any advice for the students? That's a very, very nice question, very pertinent. See, my advice has always been, always follow your heart and follow your passion. Uh, you know, if you've seen that movie, Three Idiots, you know, there's this guy who wants, his father wants him to be an engineer and he wants to do photography, right? So eventually he follows his passion. So I think I am in that, that mindset from, from, from a very long time. And I kind of always advise to follow what you really wish to do. Uh, you know, it has to be, it doesn't have to be a job or a work just for the sake of it, because then you will not enjoy it. Two months, three months, you will like the salary coming to your account and then you will say, well, you know, what am I doing here? You know, you start questioning yourself. So uh, always follow what you wish and what you are really passionate about. Uh, even if other people don't agree with you, uh, it, you know, it doesn't matter. You just have to follow. I mean, you follow what you're passionate about and you have uh, and don't go by other people's opinions. So uh, if you want to not take a campus placement, don't take a campus placement. If you don't get, if you want to do healthcare marketing like I did and, and everybody tells you don't do it, but that's your passion, follow that. So follow whatever you're passionate about and eventually you succeed. It's, it's, a, it's a path you will not regret, you know, like me 20 years down the line, when you sit and talk uh, to other, other students, you will not regret and you will be comfortable talking about it because you did what you really like to do. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, Does one, that answer yeah. the question, Piyush? I mean, was that the question or? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Now on the similar lines, uh, Vivek, he, I mean, uh, you are a very daring person. I know personally also. I mean, and you have been into, you have left the job which you got from the, uh, as a placement, then you did job, then you went into entrepreneurship, then again, India, Dubai, so many things. So about some part of that entrepreneurship, you know, 
that what motivated or what was the challenges which you faced basically with the entrepreneurship and uh, how did it went basically how, what were the hardships into it and how did you sail it through so what motivated was i think it it was self belief all the way you know right from day one i was i never had a doubt that it will not succeed and i always have a mindset where rather than saying um you know will it happen will it not happen what if i fail you know that's a mindset i, I never get into that mindset what if i fail what if this happens i don't get into those that domain at all i only talk about how to make it happen so if you are playing a cricket match and you need 20 runs in the last over you don't think oh will i do it will i not do it oh the pitch is bad oh the bowler what if he does i don't think get into that you just meet, you just th- see how i will do it you know how to make it happen i mean that's where i think if 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 youngsters today think about how to make it happen rather than whether it will happen or not that is i think that makes a big difference so that's one so uh, so not having a doubt self belief is very very important if you believe in yourself you can do anything you know there are enough examples there are there's you know there's no end of examples of people who had self i mean i am nothing i have not i haven't achieved anything compared to what people have done with self belief and what they have achieved in their lives there are enough and more examples so i think self belief and how to get it done you know how how do i do it rather than if i succeed if i fail that 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 scenario doesn't really is not a very powerful place to be that's right that's right yeah, a hardship you spoke about so there were hardships as i said there were people a lot of people would say why are you doing this you know nobody has done it before this will backfire what will happen that's that's what people will say but then say, you know people will always say it's okay for them to say it because uh, you know unless unless somebody does it people will not believe nobody believed that uh, somebody can go to the moon you know but in 1960s somebody actually went to the moon and now people believe that it's possible so there was a time when people said that the earth is flat so the ships will not sail beyond a, beyond a particular point because they think they will fall off the earth it or somebody said no it is round so there has to be somebody who challenges the norm you know i always believe that a that a questioning mind is always a powerful mind a mind that blindly accepts everything is not a powerful mind so you have a mind which questions why is it like that why it cannot change you know what will it take to change how can i change it that kind of a mind that changes more you know rather than somebody who said oh no no this is how it has been this is going to be like this so i i always had this question what kept me motivated and in in front of all the challenges was that i kept saying why it can't be done it can be done why can't it happen? you know somehow i have to find a way to do it sir as you have been into many roles from marketing consulting and entrepreneurship what kind of skill set do you suggest for us to get into such, such kind of roles good question first of all i think most important which and i work in so because i work in dubai and i work with people from across the world it's a very um global city and the environment one of the thing which in, i think we as indians we need to improve uh, or we need to have more skill is in communication uh, you know there are people who are you know in our cultures we don't we don't speak much uh and we don't listen much i mean we listen but we don't speak much it's supposed to be a humble modest quiet person right but i have seen that if you have the ability to listen and speak that's a very very important skill to develop in in the if you want to compete at the global level to be able to express your feelings to be able to express what you feel imagine sitting in a room in a board room with a ceo who's from a different country with a financier of course from different country board members so senior people sitting across the table with them if you are not able to express what you are feeling in your heart and, and express it in a way that that really you know lands there i mean they get what you are saying you know not like just say anything or not like get and i think we we guys get too emotional very soon uh, you know one bad email comes from somebody and then we get stressed and emotional about it so i think that's very important to uh, to keep emotions on side and to be able to learn to communicate that's very important one thing uh, the second skill which is uh, is there uh, which i feel is very important is to do the small little things right you know there are these little things which have to be done right i mean you we focus on a big huge things but we miss out on small things so if i have said i will 
uh, submit this file to you by 4 p.m. I submit it by 4 p.m. If I'm not able to submit by 4 p.m., when I come to know about it at 2 o'clock or 3, I call the person and say, listen, I said 4, I cannot do it by 4, can I do it at 8? These are simple, small things, but they go a long way uh, in, in creating success. So small things, do them right. Uh, another thing to focus on is to uh, to is to to do the process right. We guys are too engrossed in the end result. We want, oh, I want to earn one crore rupees before I turn 30 or 35. Oh, I want to have my next promotion. I want my first job in a big company from the campus. We are too focused on the end result. We are not focused on the process. So one thing which I've learned is focus on the process. Forget the result. Result, whether it happens, it doesn't happen, it's not, it's not in our hands. What is in our hands is, is the process. So go, go through the process, whatever has to be done, A, B, C, D, focus on that, do it well every day. Do it well every day, day after day, week after week, year after year, continue to follow the process. Results take care of, uh, of themselves on their own. Uh, but we need to look at what is the process and do that process, right? So I think these things, communication, focus on the process, uh, do the little things right. Uh, these are the skills. Uh, and also, I think, uh, as I said before, also self-belief, uh, uh, an attitude of I can do it and how it can be done rather than an attitude of, oh, what if it doesn't happen? So these are some of the things which are very important. I'm not a big fan of, of, uh, of bookish knowledge I mean, you should have understanding of books and the subject for sure. But I was never a topper in my class. I was always a backbencher. You know, in my, my MBA students used to call me outstanding student because I was mostly outside. Uh, so I was, not, I was not a very big scholar in books. But what I have learned is I think learning about life, learning about dealing with situations in life, uh, learning about creating long-lasting relationships in your work environment, in your uh, in your in your industry, uh, networking, you know these things are are after a while they become more important. And books are definitely. I'm not saying don't study at all, but after a, I mean, if you're even if you are an average student, it's fine. Even if you are a little more than average, it's fine. I mean, you don't have to flunk in all your subjects. But if you are a good student, average student, it's okay. I would rather go for an average student with an excellent attitude. Uh, and with a very positive mindset rather than go, go with a scholar who's a double PhD and who's great in his academics, but has a very bad attitude. So I will, I will rather go with the former than the latter. So develop life skills, develop communication skills, develop networking skills, uh, you know, develop writing skills, read a lot, uh, develop a positive attitude. I can do it, how I can do it, develop that kind of a thinking, develop focusing on process, uh, doing the small, simple things right. You know, develop that kind of uh, those kind of skills. You know. Thank you. So, uh, there is like one more question from my side. Like, uh, if you could please tell us what was the worst mistake which gave you the best experience, which you have learned from it, in professionally. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Vivek, I'll put it. I mean, the most critical situation where it was like, you know, I am done. And then how you actually came out of it. See, I mean, yeah, consulting yeah. as many, many of them. I mean, many times, many times. The worst mistake, don't take the payment and start doing the project. <laughs> and then and then don't ask for the payment for three months. And after three months, the client said, I'm not paying. You. So, <laughs> yeah, so, that's, so that's what happens. I, have, I mean, yeah, there have been chances. So there have been lots of times where, uh, you know, so for example, um, so when I left Aster, so that was one challenge that I had because I was, I thought I'd get back into consulting and it was not easy because I had been out of consulting for five years and I was in a different country now. So though I had the skills for consulting and I had done it before in India and I was successful, I had a big question mark if I can do it here or whether I can do it here. And every day I would tell myself, no, I'll do it. I've done it before. I can do it. Why not? And whatever the kind of consulting that I do, and Piyush knows, it's, it's very different. I don't, I mean, I, I, I do more of my consulting is on the implementation side, not on project. You know, I do project reports and I do feasibility studies and stuff, but more of it is on actually getting, um, working with the team on long-term basis and, and developing, the, uh, uh, developing the business and the performance for the client. So that was a very new thing. And I don't know if I, this will be accepted here, whether it will not be accepted here. This is a new market. It's a different market. Nobody has done it here before. 
you know, so that was that was a big challenge. I don't know if it was a mistake. It was definitely retrospectively now not a mistake. Um, but there were first two, three, four months uh, were a lot of hard work. I have, I think that was the time when I have worked hardest in my life. After I left a job and I came back into consulting, I mean, I uh, I left Astor and I joined, joined Frost first as a part-time. You know, even they didn't offer me a full-time. They said, okay, let's see six months. You have a very different thing. Whether it will fly or not fly. If it will fly, then we will take you full-time. <laughs> okay, fine. So those six months were a lot of hard work. And I think initial two or three successes were uh, were, bit, were not easy to come. Uh, but I think what saw me through was a lot of, um, of self-belief and it was not overconfidence, but it was more of, uh, I would say, more of full confidence, not overconfidence. But I was, I was fully confident that it can happen. Uh, if a doubt would come, I would say, no, they can, it can happen. And this is how I will, I will do it. So I think that was, um, I always say, and you know, after that, I always say, if, if you really have the will to do it, you will find a way. Otherwise, you will find an excuse why it was not done. So, uh, so I think, yeah. So that was, is that, the, was that the question or? Yes. Okay. okay. And sir, as you have uh, experience in entrepreneurship, any suggestion for further entrepreneurs, for the future entrepreneurs? Be different. See, be different. If you are like anybody else, then there is no market for you. Always be different. But when I say be different, you should be different in a domain where, which is your strength. Don't be different in a domain which is not your strength. So find out what is your unique strength. And then you stay with that unique strength. Uh, be consistent to that unique strength. And then go on for, and don't lose heart in six months. Don't lose heart in eight months. Go on for one year, two years, three years. Give it time. But be consistent and be different. Be consistent and be different. Always. You know, that, that creates uh, that. There are no shortcuts. There, are, there will be temptations to take a shortcut. There will be temptations to, you know, oh, let me do this. Many mistakes, uh, many entrepreneurs make a mistake where they try to do too many things. So, oh, this is not working out. Okay, let me add this one. Let me try that one. Let me. But then in the end, they end, they end up diluting their entire, uh, you know, their entire offering. So be focused. What is your strength? Focus on that and consistently work on that. Don't give up in two, three months, five months time, six months time. Consistently work, at least give it a couple of years. If you have, uh, if you are in a position of fear and if you think, oh, what if I fail? Chances are you will fail. So if the moment you get into that mindset, oh, what if I fail? Oh, if it doesn't work out, what will happen? From where will I get to next? You know, I don't have money in my pocket. I don't have money in the bank. If it flops, what will happen? If you think like that, the chances are you end up flopping. If you think, how can I make it work? Then you will find ways of how you can make it work. So it's always important what question you're asking for yourself. If you're asking a question over what if I fail, if this doesn't work out, then you know, then you go in a different direction. If you say, no, I will, I will make it work. It will work out. I can make it work. And then you go in a different direction. So consistency with the right mindset uh, will, will make it work. Thank you. Vivek, one question, Vivek. Uh, like you have a very rich experience in marketing. And as of now, if we see it's more shifting the trend towards digital marketing in healthcare. So uh, what's your take on this? Basically, do you think that traditional marketing ways are here to sustain for some time? And with the existing scenario that things are getting so far digitized, what could be the future of marketing in healthcare or specifically hospitals? How far is it going to change in maybe next five or 10 years? It will change. Uh, see, if you, uh, marketing, first of all, um, it, healthcare marketing is still primitive. If you compare it with industries, which are, you know, if you compare it with the hotels, or, or hospitality, airlines, banks, you know, it's, it's, it's quite primitive. Uh, so what it, I wish how it, it should change, and I don't know how it will change because it's difficult to predict the future, but what I want to see in healthcare is to have a very, long to not long but mid to long term focus on marketing it should not be a short term gimmick or oh, we'll give 20% discount and get people that's not marketing uh, for marketing for me is very wide marketing for me is the process of generating a new consumer a new consumer or a new patient 
that whole process is marketing. So which means it involves, it involves not just the marketing department, it involves the doctor. In fact, it involves the HR because you, in the first place, hire the kind of people who will generate a new consumer for you. Hire the kind of people who are consistent to your brand. You know, it starts with HR. It starts with hiring. It doesn't start with the marketing department. It starts with designing the hospital. If you're looking for a technology brand, if you're looking for a high-tech technology hospital, there's a different kind of building design and a different kind of equipment that you will hire. If you're looking at a very, uh, a brand which is very friendly, next door, friendly, home, like home hospital, you know, very friendly, then you hire, then you hire different kinds of people. You hire people with that attitude and mindset. So marketing is very wide. It's not just creating a brochure, creating a website and doing an Instagram social media page. And then, you know, that's one part of it, but that's too tactical. I would, I wish in the next 10 years, marketing should be more strategic. It should be more of building a brand. It should, and it should encompass everyone from HR to procurement, to doctors, to staff, everyone, everyone is part of marketing, you know, in a broader sense, you know, so if, if that's the direction a hospital or a healthcare company goes, I think they are, they will create a very, very big uh, impact in the market and they will, they have a better chance to dominate the market for a longer time. That's well said, Vivek. Uh, I'll request our students also to put up their questions uh, in the forum. In the meanwhile, our hosts can actually put up their questions if they have. So as we got your secret of uh, this positive energy and motivation, <laughs> I want to ask you that what keeps you uh, keeps on motivating and you soar your wings and flying high and high. So what keeps you motivated, sir? Please uh, advise. Too. I think what keeps me motivated is is that I am. Uh, uh, I think I'm just passionate about what I do. I I really you know, and, and it's not that I'm saying it because it's a good thing to say. I'm really saying it um, uh, very authentically that I I really love what I do. I I love solving problems. I love getting uh, uh, you know working with clients and working with people. Uh, to solve problems, helping them to break the barriers of performance and go to the next level. It's just the passion. That, and, and I, you know, I don't do it for money as much. Uh, you know, some of my projects pay me very less. But if it's a good project and if it's something that is challenging and something that I will enjoy, I will still take it up. So I work for passion. I work for something that I, I love doing. I work for, uh, you know, just for the, for the fun of it. You know, so that's, I think that's what keeps me going. The day it devolves into doing a day-to-day -day job, the day it devolves into, oh, I should earn some money and pay the bills, uh, pay the rent and pay, you know, pay, pay the school fees and stuff like that. The day it devolves to that, I think that day I will, I will not be, um, I will not be able to go as fast or as hard as I'm going now. Uh, so I think it's just passion. I just love doing it. That's it. So coming from a small town in Madhya Pradesh and now handling in a very geographies, so many geographies. So like today, what do you feel about yourself? Like, yeah, this is my, this is a result of my passion and my motivation and my positive positivity. So what do you, what do you feel today sitting here in a great position, leading those people? Can you share your uh, experience then, today? It's fulfilling in a way. It's fulfilling in a way, uh, and it's also very humbling in a way, you know, because it's not, um, it's not something that uh, one should have false pride about. It sh it's something of a, uh, it's something of a responsibility first of all, because uh, when I, if I'm working in a team and if I am leading a team or if I'm working with a client, I have, uh, you know, they have placed their future in my hands. So it's a lot of responsibility first of all. Uh, so you, you know, one wants to have response. Second thing is it's a, a lot of humbleness because uh, this is, uh, you know, one should never forget the roots from where one has come from. So I have um, a lot of respect for people who are from in small towns who work very hard for a living, who go through a lot. Like they don't have the best of the facilities. They don't have the best of the hospitals. They don't have the best of the internet. Uh, they don't have the best of uh, employment opportunities. They don't have the best of even the little small things that we have. Uh, you know, they go through a lot. So there's a lot of respect for what they do and the kind of life they live. 
Um, so I think, yeah, it's uh, what make, it makes me feel responsible. Uh, it makes me feel responsible because uh, uh, I represent, uh, you know, the, that part of India, which is uh, uh, still a small town, tier three, tier four towns and cities. So uh, yeah, a lot of responsibility and uh, yeah, in a way it's fulfilling also that there's uh, a lot of work that has gone, a lot of hard work that has happened. Uh, I put in a, a lot of work on, on, the, on the process, as I said. So there are processes and there are ways to do things which I have done over the years. So it is fulfilling, but it is quite humbling and also it's a lot of responsibility. Vivek, uh, one question. Uh, your LinkedIn posts are very thought provoking and you very smartly and very specifically point out the mall practices or I would say the flaws in the existing practices the age old tradition which have been going on. So with this mindset, if I ask you that if you have to envision a hospital of your dream, so yeah. what would it be? I think uh, things, yeah. hospital of my dream would be a hospital which is driven by people uh, and a hospital which is, uh, which is driven by brand. Uh, you know, a hospital which is because for me, a, hosp a hospital, the biggest asset of a hospital, any organization, whether a hospital or any other, any other, even different, any other industry, the biggest thing for any organization is people and brand. There's nothing beyond it. You can have the three Tesla MRI, you can have the latest whatever cat lab, you can have the latest equipment. For me, it doesn't mean anything if the person sitting in the front office is sitting there with a grumpy face and is refusing to smile. What's the point of all that equipment? So it's people, end of the day. So if a hospital, an ideal hospital for me is where people are thoroughly engaged, they are happy what they're doing, they, are, uh, they love the company that they work in, they love the culture that they are working in, uh, they, they are uh, happy to recommend the same hospital to their friends, to their relatives to come and work in the same place, and a hospital that is conscious of the brand that it is building. Uh, most hospitals, uh, you know, unfortunately, are only looking at this month's revenue, this quarter's revenue, uh, profit at, at the end of this quarter, at the end of this year. They're not looking at building a long-term brand, many of them. Uh, so an ideal hospital, and I'm not saying that short-term profit and revenue is, is bad or it, it should not be focused upon, but that cannot be the only focus of running a hospital. Uh, uh, an ideal hospital is the one that has uh, that has the ideal workforce that has a very engaged and happy, uh, motivated, highly inspired workforce, and a hospital that is conscious of the brand that it is building and it tirelessly works towards building a brand. And building a brand, mind you, is not just uh, flyer, brochure. A Facebook page and website. That's not building a brand. That's a very small part of building a brand. Building a brand, I said, is, is much, much bigger. It's building a culture. It's having this right kind of uh, mindset. It's, it's being consistent with your values and principles and being consistent with the vision and the mission that has been created. Building a brand is about um, the patient experience. Building a brand is, uh, is about hiring the right kind of people. So building a brand is about a lot of things. A hospital that is consciously, tirelessly building a brand and the one that has the right kind of people. Uh, in the beginning of the session, when you were telling about the challenges that were faced from the doctors regarding the marketing and all. So how, did, how, how was it to overcome these challenges and how the marketing in healthcare evolved to till date from that day, from early 20s, from 2000s, from where you came to here now? What was the evolving evolving nature of marketing in healthcare? It evolved, you know, because it, <laughs> when I started there, you know, most hospitals didn't even have a website. So, and marketing was a forbidden word. They said, no, marketing, wow, well, this is what healthcare has come to. You have to know market. Because people used to think marketing is like conning people. It is like manipulating people. It's like cheating. So, uh, so marketing being cheating people and from there now marketing is something which is actually adding value to the organization it has come a long way uh, it has come a long way but having said that it still has to go a long way because we still feel uh, that marketing is very 
is seen as a very short term. And when I say marketing, I'm including the sales also. So sales and marketing is seen as a very short term weapon to make some money this month. You know, some make some money uh, this week. You know, oh, get me something this week. Get me something next 10 days. They think marketing is for this, so which I think is, uh, is quite sad because though it has come a long way that there is some acceptance that there is something called marketing and sales in healthcare and it has to be given its due respect and due place in, in, in the ecosystem. Uh, but it still has to go a long way. It has to evolve into, uh, uh, into a tool that builds long-term brands. It has to evolve into uh, a practice that creates a long-term advantage for a hospital or a group of hospitals. So uh, Vivek, uh, like one thing, you have been working in Middle East and you have fair experience of India as well. So yeah. uh, just basically from the, if I ask you, what gaps do you see based on if you compare between the hospital industry in Middle East and hospital industry in India? So what are the still gaps which are uh, persisting and which need to be actually tackled on priority? Uh, so I think the gaps, uh, uh, one is, is infrastructure, hospital infrastructure, you know, the buildings uh, which you see in this part of the world and the buildings that you see in India for hospitals, there's a, there is a gap. Um, you know, the, the cleanliness of the building, the cleanliness of the toilets of the hospital building, uh, the overall uh, look and feel and the ambience and, you know, the way, uh, I think there's a, there is a gap there. Uh, the second gap would be uh, would be technology. Uh, so uh, I think Indian Indian doctors are the best doctors, at least uh, in, in Asia. Or in, I mean, they are one of the best. We have one, we have the best talented when it comes to one of the best talents when it comes to doctors. Uh, but it has to. But they have to be given an appropriate uh, technology. They have to be given an appropriate infrastructure to 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 deliver what they are delivering. Uh, processes and systems which are based on uh, which are based on technology, which are based on uh, lean uh, lean systems and as well as technology. So that is is I think a, a, a gap as well. Access to healthcare, uh, you know, access to healthcare insurance. As I said, this part of the world, uh, there's a lot of people in some places. Everyone has insurance, so so access to healthcare through insurance. Is, is important. India has done uh, work in that in that direction with Ayushman Bharat and other things, uh, but I think more needs to be done. So access to healthcare, these are some of the gaps. Can you take on the technology perspective? Like now we talk about artificial intelligence, IOTs, and all these things. Yeah. So how far actually they are uh, successful in the healthcare setting? Because somewhere they add to cost, and then you talk about profitability. So yeah. can you share some thoughts over that? It's, I think, very early, early days for uh, AI and other things. So um, it, it's, I would say there is a lot of hype about it. And there are some, some uh, scenarios where it has done well. Uh, but I think it's early days to see whether, you know, how far it will go. Even remote health monitoring, uh, teleconsultations, as we saw, was something that in the COVID days. So yeah, so I think it will take a little bit of time uh, to see it see actually where it goes. Uh, but look, let's see, let's wait and see where it goes. Yeah, yeah true. Because I think somewhere that's a challenge. I mean, uh, you have like you no know, escape from integrated technologies, and then if you integrate, then that adds to cost, and then you question about the profitability. But yeah, uh, I mean, it adds to the cost again. See, it's all um, long term. So, what's the vision? I mean, if it's if the vision is long term, and somebody. Uh, really wants to challenge the norm and wants to set up a system which is completely based on AI and which is completely based on remote monitoring or, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in for it. If somebody wants to do it, why not? You know, I've always challenged the norms and I've always asked questions of, of why things cannot change. So why not? I mean, it can be done, uh, provided again, as I said earlier, that provided it is done consistently, you give it a few years, you do it and you learn as you go along and you continue to do it, it can still be done. But if it's only short term, and if it's looking at cost for only this year, this quarter, and what, how it will, then, then I think then it is uh, not going to take off. How do you stand from the, our competitors while marketing a hospital or something, like without uh, any ethical issues? Uh, uh, can you say that again? 
how okay. do we stand out from our competitors sir, in while marketing our hospital or our organization related to some healthcare like it might hurt the other fe- other people feelings and all even for minor things like how do we stand out from, from all those there are various ways to dif- to to stand out and differentiate a healthcare service uh, you know there are hospitals who stand out based on technology so they say we are uh, the smart hospital we are the high tech place uh there are hospitals like uh, uh like mayo in the us they stand out or based on healing environment they say we create an environment which is a healing environment so they have a piano being played in the lobby they have sunlight in in the rooms and all that so they create a healing environment there are hospitals which uh stand out uh based on uh, on legacy on heritage so you have uh, you know somebody who says i have 60 years of heritage i have 40 years of heritage i have 25 years of legacy of care so people stand out on that people stand out on um, uh, they differentiate on a very personalized customized service uh, another way to differentiate is a specialty focus so for example uh, the classic example is in canada there is a hospital that only does hernia surgery that's it so they only do hernia they don't do any other surgery and they have and it's not a small hospital it's a huge place and there is a six month waiting for getting a hernia surgery done they are so famous people and people wait for six months they don't they don't drop out so it's a specialty focus they only do one thing day in and day out that's another way to differentiate there are many ways you can differentiate based on who the leader is so sometimes like uh, a non healthcare example uh, you know like you have uh, uh uh what's that guy virgin virgin uh uh forgot his name richard so richard branson is the face for his brand virgin right? atlantic <laughs> yeah virgin atlantic so he is, so you can you can differentiate based on uh, who the leader is so you have to find various ways to to differentiate and uh, you know so size can be differentiator the largest biggest you know that can be a differentiator so uh yeah we have a question yeah so the question is that sir having an enormous experience in the healthcare industry do you support technological advancements in the healthcare or is it better to stick with the conventional do you agree that there is a resistance to technological adop- adoption from the doctor side if yes how do we overcome it <laughs> yeah i mean there is not always an, uh, always uh, i mean there is resistance to any forget doctors everyone is resistant to uh, to change you know because it shakes you from your comfort zone uh, and to overcome this is uh, is a prerogative of of the leadership so if the ceo and if the leaders of the organization are able to showcase uh, the advantages of embracing the technology and if they are able to instill uh some sort of excitement and enthusiasm about the new technology uh the resistance can go down uh there are various other ways to counter the resistance when you counter resistance like this you will always want to find a path of least resistance so if there are 100 people who are there and the change is being introduced all 100 will not have the same resistance i may have more resistance you may have also you may have resistance but your resistance may be lower somebody else may also have resistance but very little resistance so you find the path of least resistance if you are going to introduce a change then don't come to me because i have the highest resistance go to the one who has the lowest first so you start with the low resistance people first get them to adopt the change and then you showcase the success to others and showcase the advantages to others and see this guy made a change and see how he's advancing see how what advantages he got and see how how he and how the organization benefit so you find the path of least resistance for change that's one secondly you always continue to link it with something i call w i i f m what is what's in it for me if i'm giving you something which you have to change you will ask me a question oh i will do it but what's in it for me why should i do it what's in it for me now we don't answer that question for the doctors or for other executives who are who have to undergo a change you need to tell them what's in it for them what advantage they will get by doing this right so find the path of least resistance uh, what's in it for me address that 
lead by example do it yourself first and show people how it is done these are some of the ways you need to introduce technology even whether it is technology or a new process or anything new that you introduce in an organization needs to follow a few you know some of these things well said we wait uh, yeah we wait one question uh, doing marketing in india for a hospital and doing marketing for a hospital in middle east is it same or are there any differences here i would like to request you to throw some light regarding the any kind of regulations government foundations which you have uh, uh, on the marketing of healthcare yeah so uh, regulations are different uh, it is much more regulated here uh, every advertisement that we create even if it's an sms that is going out to uh, audience to a, to a, to the masses needs a ministry of health approval so you need to take approval for all communication that goes out uh, outside the organization whether it's an sms whether it's a radio ad whether it's a, uh, even your website needs to be approved so everything that goes out is is strictly monitored and needs to be approved if you don't take approvals there are fines in india the regulation is is slightly uh, is slightly loose i mean it's less Uh, there are certain things you can do as per the code of ethics and stuff like that and then there are certain things that you cannot do however it's not regulated as highly as uh, strictly so that's uh, that is the difference as far as the regulation goes as far as the messaging goes uh, here uh, you know you you have a very diverse ethnicity so you have people from all parts of the world so your messaging needs to cater to different audiences there are certain times when you will only advertise in arabic there are certain times when you will only advertise in english there are certain times when you will advertise in uh, uh, in tagalog which is a philippines language or in in bangladesh in in bengali so you there are different people from depending on your audience you you go with lots of different languages india also you go with english and and the regional language uh, but here i think it uh, it the the diversity is 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 much much more for do you think it some way <laughs> takes away the creative aspect of the marketing i mean because uh, when getting something through a very stringent regulation then more or less things will become standard for all the contestants that's true it takes it away i mean you have to do uh, uh you have to hire consultants like me then you have to pay money <laughs> then i will tell you how you can do it <laughs> but yes it is difficult uh it it you have to then you have to be then extra creative uh you know this uh, or you will end up as standard you know dr p who has joined the gastroenterology joined our hospital for appointments call this you have to be that standard and everyone is that standard or you do something which is really extra and very very creative which will also be within the framework of regulations so you have to think a, a little extra you know it's just not as easy it's not as easy yeah. as doing uh, yeah. correct yeah it's is different yeah shri harsha you have a question yeah actually it's from the audience so chandrika is asking like opportunities in consulting for healthcare management background she wants to know the opportunities and what skills we need to have to be a consultant ah okay that's my favorite question so the second part is my favorite question but first let me address the first part so um there are opportunities definitely people who have healthcare management background a lot of opportunities it always helps if you have some experience of run, of being a part of a hospital team like being part of a hospital uh, provider uh, and then move into consulting it usually it helps like for me i was running my own hospital uh, and then after a few years i came into consulting so then i had an idea of what a hospital is and how it is run uh, it always helps uh there are consultants in uh, in healthcare who have never worked in a hospital uh, uh and they work for some of them even work for the biggest consulting firms and and if you ask them the difference between endocrinology and gastroenterology then they will struggle so um uh, but if it really works to work in a hospital for sure uh, and then get into consulting and what are the skills for good consulting uh, is very important because um, a lot of people think they can be a good consultant and you will agree with me uh almost every second person thing ah oh, consulting very easy very easy and it is such a glamorous thing you know you are traveling uh from one country to another one city to another you are meeting this ceo you are meeting that chairman and you are only working with the cxo level people so it looks very glamorous from outside uh 
uh, but it's it's uh, eight out of ten can think that they can become consultants. But out of those eight, only one or two can actually become, and six or seven of them are just over, uh, you know, uh, thinking. Uh, so they are. So it's not easy. It's slightly tough because I'll tell you the two things in consulting. Two or three things. One is uh, your um, uh, ability to communicate has to be really, very, very good. You know, and uh, and Piyush has been also on this side of the table, so he will tell you when you talk to CEOs, when you talk to the senior, senior guys, uh, you cannot be. Uh, not sure of what you're talking, body language, confidence, the way, ability to speak, uh, communicate, even writing emails or writing skills have to be really good. Uh, as a consultant, you are expected to, uh, to speak in industry conferences, industry events, and showcase your thought leadership there. So you need to have good public speaking skills as well. Uh, so those are the skills you need. And then on top of that, you need subject knowledge. You can be a very good communicator. You can be a very good speaker. You can be a very nice person to talk to and you are very confident in your body language and everything, but you have zero knowledge of your subject. So you will fail as a consultant because then you have only one side of it, but you don't have the subject knowledge. Uh, thirdly, you other skill you need, so you need a deep knowledge and you need to keep updating the knowledge every now and then. Uh, thirdly, you need a lot of uh, networking skills uh, because consulting, if you're not networking, if you're not reaching out to people and if you're not networking heavily, uh, then you don't get new clients. So you, to get new clients, you need to be very well networked in your industry. Uh, so that's another very, very important thing. Um, and you will, and you must be able, last fourth thing is you must be able to sell yourself as a consultant, as a professional, whether you work for a big company or you work as an individual, you need to be able to sell yourself. Some people I've met are very good at selling themselves, but they don't have the subject knowledge. Some people have a great amount of subject knowledge and they are very masters in their subject, but they cannot sell themselves. So selling yourself, networking, communicating, and uh, subject knowledge. That's well said. I mean, <laughs> totally agree with you, we wait for that. Yeah. So yeah, any more you, questions? Yeah. yeah. You've been on that side. See, if you're very good in your subject, Correct but you're not able to network and bring clients, then you will not go beyond an analyst. You will at best be a senior analyst because then you're not client facing. If you are client facing and really good with clients, but you don't have subject knowledge, then also you don't go far. You need both. You know, to go yeah, far see, I used to do those time motion studies when I was actually a trainee initially my days and all of my colleagues left actually within six yeah. months. So I was the only one sustaining yeah. and I realized the benefit when I actually moved into consulting. So yeah. the things which others didn't know, I had everything on tape from chemicals to the flooring mops and everything. Yes. So entire processes, everything I can visualize and pin out, pinpoint the problem. So yes. that's well said. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Sri Harsha and Madhula, you have any questions? No, sir. That's all from our side. And okay. I think the audience also, they already put their questions and they are yeah. addressed. Thanks a lot, Vivek. Uh, hearty thanks to you for coming to this portal and uh, en enriching our students' perspective on healthcare industry and how they should actually go forward. And it's really been a pleasure, pleasure interacting with you and hope to see uh, on the next portal once yes. again. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Really enjoyed being here. Uh, always a pleasure talking to students and youngsters. They are the future. Uh, so thank you very much and thank you for having me. Thanks thank a lot, you. sir. Thanks a lot.